Hi, I'm DJ Ware. On this episode of the Cyber Gizmo, we're going to deal with a little bit of the building blocks for containers. In one of my last videos, I had some questions in regards to containers and security about flat packs, which also have to do with containers. And uh, the suggestion was, why don't you come back and tell us how containers and, and work? So in order to do that, I really need to back up a second and get down to the atomic level and explain namespaces and secrets. Uh, we'll probably cover Chirrut and some portion because those three together are really the three legs of the stool that makes up a container. But uh, the main two pieces are namespaces and C groups, and I want to cover those today with you. I'll get to that right after this. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to do this kind of as an introduction today to namespaces and C groups because there's, there's it is a confusing thing, and I, I don't want you to leave confused. I want you to leave understanding what it is. So let's let's get started. So where did namespaces come from? Uh, they showed up in the Linux kernel around 2002, and the reason for it was there was a need to be able to partition kernel resources. What do you mean partition? Usually when we talk about partitioning, we're usually allocating resources uh, so that a particular set of processes can see their particular view that they need of those resources, and yet I can define another group of a set of processes that see completely some different, see something completely different. So, so yeah, so one process sees one set of resources, another process sees a different set of resources. That was the reason behind it. And the resources we're talking about here aren't, aren't, aren't just any resources, they are kernel resources. So yeah, so that's, that's number one. C groups were added in 2007, and this code was provided by Google to the, to the uh, Linux kernel. Now, and every time I bring up Google, I always get people that just cringe. You know, Google has been a major competitor, uh, contributor, yeah, competitor, they've been a major contributor to Linux for quite some time. So if you're afraid of Google, you probably should move on from Linux because they have, they're, they, uh, they're not the heaviest contributor, but they, they, uh, they definitely have a large part, a large hand in it. So, yeah. Anyway, that's the reason why we do open source is so that the source code is published. And I think a lot of people forget that. So if you think that Google is hiding stuff inside there, we'll find it. We'll discover it. So yeah, anyway, <laughs> C groups, what are they? So originally they were called container groups and then th that just caused all kinds of confusion uh, because there's a lot of different kinds of containers. Containers aren't just Docker. Uh, so <laughs> yeah, there's all kinds of containers and uh, <clears throat> yeah, you start saying container groups, people are gonna go, wait, that doesn't, that doesn't use those. Why are you calling it that? So they dropped it and made it control groups. So there's some two versions of it currently available. The first version is not called version one, it's just C groups, and that appeared uh, in uh, the version 2.6.24 in my notes. Now I have seen people on the internet say that it's 2.6.19. I don't know, I wasn't involved in the kernel back then, so um, <clears throat> I don't know, maybe. Uh, maybe they're right. Maybe I'm right. I don't know. Maybe you guys know the answer, but uh, it doesn't really matter. The, what really matters is there wasn't anything, and now there is. So the second version appeared, and it's a complete rewrite. I mean, it you can't think of version 2 as being directly compatible with version 1. They're not. Um, in fact, uh, but anyway, that the version 2 appeared in the kernel version 4.5, and and the reason why I'm laughing is because in 2019, the Fedora project actually replaced their default C group with C group version two. And all of a sudden Docker didn't work. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so yeah, there was, a, there was a few surprises in uh, Fedora 31 and that was one of them. Uh, <clears throat> so namespaces really refer more to namespace isolation some think that that's part of C groups. It's not. It, it isn't. C groups and namespaces are two different things. They're not the same. Uh, names, I, namespace isolation is part of the kernel. 
I have to think of it that way. So, so groups of processes are separated so that they can see resources, so they can not see resources in other groups. So that's the whole purpose behind it is that I'm trying to make these resources available to this group of processes, and yet I don't want that group of processes to have anything to do with it. Okay, that's that's basically it. So. Don't make it any more complicated than that. So usually in development, we we talk about wrappers, and wrappers are used to either abstract or protect or add code that's necessary in order to be global. In other words, I need this code to always function no matter what happens. And so we always talk about wrappers as being something that is added onto uh, maybe a device driver, maybe a, a, a routine that's, go, that's going through the kernel. But so in this case, namespaces are a global system wrapper and they wrap a resource so that the processes that are running in a namespace look like it has its own isolated instance of those resources. So my resources cannot be directly accessed by processes which are not members of that namespace. That's the idea behind it anyway. So namespaces partition the kernel resources and each process that's running inside of a namespace can only see the resources that have been allocated to it. They're not allowed to see anyone else's. They're not allowed to see the host system resources either. So they're ba it basically is a, it, it's a bubble, right? So anything it can see anything inside the bubble, but anything outside the bubble or in another bubble, it can't see. That's, that's it. In theory. <laughs> Um, what kind of namespaces are we talking about? It says, I mean, you, I mean, a file, a file name is a namespace, right? So yeah, it can be, yes. But um, the major ones are the, the first one is the user namespace. This allows a a process to have a P, PID of one, process ID of one, while it can expose a different one to the host I, I the host operating system. So in other words, inside the container. This particular process could be running as process ID one, so that would be what system D, right? Normally, so it can look like it's part of system D, and yet on the host system it shows up completely different because if it didn't, it would conflict with the process ID one that's already running on the host system. So that's the necessary one to have to that you need. The second one is IPC namespaces. And that's interprocess communication. IPC can, can isolate uh, from IPC can be isolated from processes. In other words, same thing. I have a, a, a block of memory that I've assigned for interprocess communication. I'm allowing different processes to write to it, but and if in this case, I can only see that IPC if I'm a member of that namespace. If I'm if I am a member, I see it. If I'm not a member, I don't see it. So the IPC isn't available to me. The other one is the Unix time sharing namespace. I talked about this in the in the uh, Unix internals a little bit, but you can have your own host and domain name inside the container, and that's what this particular namespace allows you to do. So, and then your container host names can communicate with other host names that are inside your system, provided you've allowed that. But yeah, so that allows one group of processes to, have be, a, to be assigned a host name and a domain name that's different than the host and the host operating system that is running your containers. The mount namespace controls which mount point. So in your Linux operating system, you, when you mount a file system, you mount it to a mount point, a place in the file system to which you are going to attach a, 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 a disk drive or an SSD or some other mechanism, a USB stick, whatever. And that file system then is available only to those processes in that namespace to which that mount point was assigned. And again, processes outside of that namespace can't see that mount point, they can't mount it, they can't use it, it's not theirs. So yeah, that's another way of isolation. So and then we have PID namespace. That allows isolation of PID numbers so that duplicates can exist on the host operating system and the container without conflict. Uh, and the reason why you need that is obvious. I mean, if I have a child uh, process which spawned off from some other PID, 
I would be sending messages to the to the possibly the child, possibly the parent, and I want to make sure that the appropriate communications mechanisms are maintained uh, in order to communicate with the process I intended that message to go to and not to be siphoned off by something else. So anyway, network namespace, uh, that allows each container to have its own IP address, its own routing table, its own, its, its own, uh, its own firewall rules, and even its own set of network devices. So, and that allows you to do that for the container outside of the host operating system. So C groups, we already talked about it, it's a control group, but what does it do? So C groups isolates a process's ability to access a system resource. So you can think of namespaces as, as, as being the, is limiting the processes to a set of resources, but it doesn't mean they can use them. C groups a lot is the thing that actually defines what processes can use which resources. So uh, all the thing that you can do with the namespace is here's the resources you can see. A C group is used to, here are the processes, here's the set of resources that your process can actually use. So that's the control. So you have the definition in the namespace, the control in the C group. That's why it's called the control group. There's many different kinds of uh, uh, C groups. There's block IO. This is how you would limit or measure IO that's going to each set of processes that are members of a specific C group. So for example, you, you might have a, a VoIP uh, calling system that you want to be able to throttle it up to a maximum so that it isn't consuming resources from your database server that's on the same network. So um, maybe not a great design, but uh, in this case, what you're doing is you're basically saying, I'm only going to allow this kind of through this much throughput for the VoIP system, and I'm going to reserve the rest of the bandwidth for the database. So that's a, just a bad example, but I mean, you get the idea. CPUs allow you to monitor the CPU usage for a group of processes. So you can take uh, processes that are in one C group and you can monitor them completely separately from another group of processes in a different C group. So if you're doing things like how much CPU utilization is this customer using versus that customer, yeah. And then that would then feed into the CB, CPU account, which is the next thing which generates reports on CPU usage by C group. So then you could then bill it off back to them. CPU set allows you to pin resources to specific CPU. So uh, I can take processes that are in a C group, in one C group, and I can assign them processors two, four, and eight, for example, on a, uh, on a, let's say that it's an octa-core, let's say it is a, let's say it's a, a 10 core machine and I'm gonna reserve two cores for the host operating system and then I'm gonna allocate the even ones to this C group and I'm gonna allocate the odd CPUs to that C group. So you can then pin that. So those processes can't be, those CPUs won't be using cycles that are belong to the other C group. A device allows or de denies access to devices by a task in a C group. So these would be physical devices, and that could be hard drives, it could be memory, it could be uh, any number of things, but even a printer could, could be one of the things. So, But the control is really controlling the read and write access to a device for a specific C group. So uh, yeah, so it, you might be limited to just read on that device. You might have full read-write capabilities. It might be even write-only. There are some, some applications in Lockbox uh, in banking where they just allow you to write and not be able to read <laughs> transactions that went into the lockbox. That's why it's called a lockbox. Um, freezer is a subsystem which allows tasks in a C group to be suspended and resumed. So it's not a, it's not a way to start and stop jobs. It's just a way to, to suspend them for a moment. Maybe you're, you're in a situation where the system is just totally out of control and you're just burying the CPUs. So maybe you want to stop some processes, but you don't want to shut them down. You just want to suspend operations on them temporarily, allow the system to recover, and then resume them later. Or maybe you're doing maintenance on, on a resource that those are using and you got and you don't want to just take the system down to do it. 
memory limits the amount of memory tasks in a C group can consume. So how much memory does this C group actually get? So it doesn't allow it to go over that. There's also a, there's also a, a counterpoint to that where you have OO, uh, OODM, where you have out of memory, the out of memory handler. Those can also see uh, a different view of the out of memory handler uh, or OOM in, in one set of C groups, and then you can have a different set of roles for OOM in another C group. So another way of doing fine grain control. The last two are NetCLS. Okay, so. Um, so where was I before I was rudely interrupted? Uh, so uh, a subsystem which enables the tag network packets with a class ID is what Net NetCLS is used for. And that is used to identify which C group that a set of network packets came from. So that allows you to, to say, oh, that came from here, and if I'm going to send a response back, then it would go back down the, the uh, wire to that particular system using that class ID. Net uh, prior, PRIO, P, Priority IO is a subsystem that sets the priority on network packets dynamically. So a, 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 a poor man's QoS, kind of, <laughs> kind of, um, for the system. So... Why did I start with namespaces and C groups? Because it's critical to understanding containers. Uh, without a basis for understanding on the, on the on the namespaces and C groups, you won't understand how containers work because those are the building blocks for containers. And it doesn't really matter um, if it's Docker or Lexi or whatever, they all use similar types of mechanisms to do it, even flat packs. So next time we'll dive a little deeper into containers. It won't just be Docker. I'll try to cover enough of it to try to explain some of the differences between some of the different container mechanisms. So a lot of this, kind of in closing, a, a lot of this has, has grown up over time. I mean, we had Cheroot in 79. I think it was in 82 that BSD actually picked it up not FreeBSD, the original BSD, the, the Berkeley uh, software distribution. Uh, but that that actually picked it up in 82, and then BSD didn't really like it. So, I mean, when FreeBSD came around, I think it was version 4, they actually implemented a proper jail called Jails. And Jails and Chiroot are not the same things. Uh, jails goes way, way beyond Chiroot. I mean, it's... Um, yeah, if you're interested in that, maybe we could cover that. Now, I have covered uh, jails for Linux uh, because there was some work that was done, gosh, seven years ago now, I think, on, on how to bring the Berkeley jails into Linux. And, of course, it's not the same. Uh, and it's, it, it Fire Jails is one of those products that derived some semi from jails on BSD. I don't want to say it derived from it because BSD's version of jails is completely integrated into the kernel and Linux didn't have those things set up into it. So Linux has kind of had to do things a little bit differently, I guess might be the best way to say it. It's not, it's not that it's wrong. It's just that Linux is not BSD. I mean, they're just not the same OS. So I think I'll stop here before I get myself in any further trouble. <laughs> I, hope, uh, I, hope, please, I hope you enjoyed this today. If you did, please like and subscribe and hope to see you all again real soon. And bye for now.